Richard is Chris Redfield with a hernia. When I did his voice, the directors said, you know, we've got this other character that we need to do. Can you do a, a different voice from Chris? And I said, well, yeah, if this is Chris, then this is Richard. I need serum. I mean, that's Richard. You know, <laughs> Ruining the magic. <laughs> yeah, that is the magic. This is Katie O'Hagan, the voice of Mia Winters. And when I'm not babysitting temperamental bioweapons, I'm listening to the Crimson Head Elder podcast. Can you see that area behind me beneath the red tinted sky? That is what's left of Raccoon City. Our platoon is cut off. No survivors found. I'd rather starve to death in here than be eaten by one of those undead monsters. We're both gonna die. Wait, don't shoot! Down! I lost all my men because of her! All is lost. Cries of agony. Spurs. Unity breeds power. Ladies, gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the 28th Crimson Head Podcast. 28 already, Paul? Jeez, wow. We have been going and... through almost 10 years. <laughs> well, welcome also to Resident Evil at the Movies. My name is Joe White. I'm the voice of Chris Redfield, not from the films, but from Resident Evil Remake. And joining me for our little excursion today is the rest of the Crimson Head team. We have George Trevor. Howdy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have the Oracle Dragon. Hello, everyone. And Batgirl. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us. And uh, most importantly, our guest today, we have an expert on the subject of Resident Evil at the movies. Our special guest, please welcome the writer and producer of the short film, Dave, Sean Liebert. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. We're so happy you're here, Sean. This is going to be really interesting for us being the Resident Evil nerds that we are and the film nerds that we are. You know, I'm a nerd as well, so let's get on. Nerds get in free at the door. Just don't eat my cereal. That's all I ask. <laughs> Why don't we jump right in? Let's let you, Sean, give us a little information about this project that you've got started. So I've been going back to the very beginning of it all. Growing up, I've been a, a huge gamer, loving storytelling. And it's it's been with me through the years, you know, as a writer of short stories, screenplays. Then mm -hmm. I went to film school. And um, for some reason, Resident Evil has always been with me. This project, Dave, a proof of concept, was a, a passion project, something that I thought was just needed to be done let me jump in right there and say, why do you feel it needed to be done? And I have a, an opinion on that myself, but let me hear what you have to say about that. Ever since I played the games, it was always in the back of my head that even back in 96, after playing the first game, I was like, this game has to be made into a movie. Agreed. And it was so cinematic and the storytelling is so subtle, but also so like verbose with the drama and the horror. The initial impression was like, it, you know, this survival horror game was the first of its kind. It just needed to be told. And at the time you would have the early days of video games to the movies. It, that was a huge deal to get that yeah. kind of status. Nowadays, we're, we're kind of bridging that gap where games are just automatically becoming part of that mainstream fashion of filmmaking making and series. I've always felt that video games were heading in the direction of being interactive movies. Oh, I agree. It's the next generation of comic book movies and video games deserve that spotlight. Absolutely. Sure. Now we're going to delve very deeply the challenges of translating Resident Evil, the narrative to film or a television drama, Civilization. In terms of introducing you and your relationship with the genre, what would you say your history and relationship with Resident Evil and the wider survival horror genre is? Well, my history is like, I played through all the games. I am instantly connected to the characters, the story, uh, the lore, the timelessness of what it's trying to say that I feel may or may not be interpreted pretty well now with the current and previous films that I th I, th I think it still has to be left explored because when you think of Resident Evil, like what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Most people would probably be saying zombies, but for me, I don't know if it's necessarily just about that. Of course, you have the biohazard completely agree. The side yeah. of it, but we're talking about Umbrella here, which is a huge corporation that has its foot in everything. Society, politically, it's modern charged in 
in our world right now that I think that's why we like it so much. Subconsciously, we see all these things that are happening in our reality that actually kind of touch on that. Yeah, the parallels are frightening, aren't they? Yes. Thematically about control, DNA manipulation, going into cloning. I mean, that that's far-fetched, and that may not be too far-fetched later on. These are horrors. These are existential horrors that are happening right now that these games have already portrayed decades ago. The first Resident Evil game I really immersed myself in is the remake of the first one. I played the remake before I'd played the original on the GameCube that Joe stars in as Chris. I wouldn't say I was a fan of the zombie genre. It was all yeah. about the atmosphere for me and the emotional right. the emotional ties. And I was just shocked, not just by the narrative that's played on screen, but by the human tragedy that was unfolding in the files that you read as you pick up as you're exploring the Spencer Mansion. Yes. That's clearly evident and comes across in the themes and the acting and the direction that we see during those 12 minutes. What sparked the decision to write your Resident Evil Arclay film entitled Dave, and why did you decide to avoid the Resident Evil narrative and iconography? Yeah, sure. So I think it was like in 2014, I finally got around to watching Hannibal the TV show. And to me, it was phenomenal. Production design, filming, technique, acting, superb. When I saw that first season, it just clicked with me that these two characters basically had a chess game with one another, figuring out each other's moves. It just struck a chord with me. And it's always been in the back of my head when it comes to Resident Evil. How do you establish a precursor to the original games? You have this world that has untapped source material that has never been explored yet. When it comes to fans of the games, they want to see those important moments, and that's great. But I feel like building up to that. Even in the intro of Resident Evil 1, you have Chris Redfield's voiceover. Mm -hmm. He talks about people being eaten, not sure where the evidence is pointing to. I want to see that story. I want to see characters coming together and being like, what the heck's going on? You have a team of people that are trying to figure out all these elements together. And I thought it would be a perfect time to like show a detective story within the mountains, exploring these bizarre murders that are taking place. So then I connected the dots and I created Jim Reinhardt, who's in the Dave, who's the protagonist in that, and wanted to explore that. And this might trickle into the Resident Evil canon, but I had this whole idea of like Albert Wesker being the captain of the investigative bureau and stuff like that. So he had his own origin there that I don't think many people know yet. You would get trickles of other characters that would be spliced into it before the stars came into the spotlight. You would see the origins of all these other people, how they got the roles within stars, because all we know is their biographies about what their expertise are, but we don't really know what they've done to get there, right? So simple and sweet to start with the detective show that started extrapolating over time, like kind of like a Games of thrones -y, where you start seeing other storylines starting to mesh mm -hmm. together. Now, as a writer, when you talk about writing a series, you have several different arcs. You have an overall arc that covers whatever the amount of episodes that you have. You have an arc that goes from the beginning to the end. And then each episode has its own arcs. Would you take the entire arc of your series as being one game? Or is that the totality of the Resident Evil canon? The first season, would that be the story of Resident Evil 1? The first season was would be kind of the introduction or the prequel to building up to the events that we know and love. That would be more so the detective investigative arc. If you love Marvel and how they handle their content, the way I see Resident Evil is that it's kind of its own Marvel universe, has its own universe. You'd have a season breaking down all the new characters, Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, etc. But then by the end of the first season, the, you have the inaugural ceremony of stars. That's a big iconic moment. That would be the finale. You go all the way back to the beginning of the groups that are going to ultimately are going to come together and solve the puzzle that is uh, what's right. happening in the mansion. Yeah. I've tinkered around with writing a uh, Resident Evil 1 screenplay. It's hard to introduce this huge ensemble without trimming somewhere. Chris and Jill are protagonists, but if you care about the side characters, you really feel like they're important to the story. You got to explore those first. Who is the show for? Can both types of audience, the traditional video game narrative, no changes to the video game, and the wider horror genre audience be satisfied simultaneously? Because at the end of the day, the significant financial success that every and each Paul W.S. Anderson film enjoyed, with all six releases, all making considerable money, irrespective of the fan or critical opinion whether you can include this whole cast of stars members on screen people seem almost obsessed fans obsessed with translating the video game narrative that obviously speaks to the controversial decision of roberts to leave out barry burton 
I think the biggest issue is a lot of fans see Resident Evil and its content as gospel, that it should be mm-hmm. exact. I don't know if fans exactly want exact, because if it's an exact, it's not going to be good. And what I mean by that is you kind of have to adapt into a film. So like the reason why Resident Evil, is the first one, is so lean on story is because you as a player are investigating the mystery. You're vicariously living through these characters who are unraveling this plot. Jill and Chris aren't really developing more so as characters within the first half of the game, and it's because you are that character. What's developing is you're investigating the documents within the lore of the mansion and unraveling it that way. And then you have sprinkled moments of side characters like Barry and Richard and Rebecca talking to these other characters, being you, and helping them navigate the path toward the end of the game, but they're not really developing as one should in a a film it's interesting that as a player of a game you're really creating the story as you go every time you play it even Mm -hmm. if you replay a game you're telling a different story how you transport yourself through all those situations is going to be different every time you play it right with a movie it's going to be the same every time you watch it because it's set but as a writer how do you plug in that sense of Yeah, it's challenging because when you look at an adaptation, even as a book form, like how Spielberg does his adaptations, and the way I see it is I have to think about it as a book. I can't think about it as a game because there's so many interactivity and segments that it feels like, okay, you have to start figuring out emotionally what you want this character to be. You have to have their origin find its way connectively through the tissue of the the game or the story. So if we're following Chris, or we're following Jill, my first question is, why do we need to follow this person? Mm -hmm. Because if you're not really exploring that person, it's going to be boring. And again, this is coming from the writing or the film or the TV aspect, not the game, because the game is you transporting yourself as the character. When I play a game, a certain part of my personality is projected onto that character. Right. So that's a really good thing, because you have games now that are very interactive to the point where you make choices, like Mass Effect you have to find that connective tissue, that core strength about why Jill is important to explore. And you kind of have to find a way to make the first act of your film or TV show about that person, not necessarily the plot. You kind of have to extrapolate Jill's origin, Chris's origin, find reasons why they make choices the way they do later on. But Mm -hmm. if you just adapt and have Chris go from dining room to the labs and just figure out puzzles along the way, that's not a very exciting story. You have to find what the emotional connection is. And as a writer, you have to find that and what solidifies that person to become alive in your story. What is the character at the beginning of the film and how do they change over the course of the film? Right. That's because fundamental to writing is you know, you've got the character arc. The characters at the end of the game or at the end of the film is not going to make the same choices that they made at the beginning of the film because they've got all this new information and all these experiences that they've gone through that have now shaped them into this character that they are at the end of the film. In a video game, there's not as much character growth, which I think is a disservice to video games. And I think that we're seeing stories for video games, especially in this genre, that are displaying a much more apparent growth of the character over time. Yeah, I mean, I think a few examples is like Link from Zelda, a few games where it suggests that he talks, but doesn't. he's a silent protagonist. It's your action within the game that dictates who they are as, as a character. And that's somehow over time has become such a timeless protagonist is because of, you know, what he does, what he experiences. But it's not really him talking his way through a story. It's It's you. Your yeah, because if you see a lot of YouTubers who play video games with side protagonists, they're basically putting themselves as a character. They're examining something, yeah, I don't like that, and they just make the character like shake their head no or something like that because they want to express themselves through the character and give the character more life since they're a silent protagonist. Yeah, exactly. You're giving the players an opportunity to be something that they can't be, which is this character, a superhero or a super detective or whatever. You're allowing them to be that character and make choices with the abilities and information that that character has. In a movie, you don't get those choices because the choices are made for you. 
a movie is more passive than a game. And that's yeah. why people love games. And it's because it's more dynamic. You get to choose. If I say, oh, I don't like what this character says or does in the movie, that's my choice. I mean, I can't control that. But I think that's why as a writer, it can be so overwhelming because you're kind of intimidated by the reaction, the feedback, because you mm-hmm. want people to be happy with what you've done. Mm-hmm. But it's really up to you about what they say, what they do that defines the whole picture. That's kind of terrifying. It is. <laughs> We're very lucky enough to interview Anthony Johnson, the writer from Dead Space. And of course, Isaac Clarke in Dead Space is the silent protagonist. Um, Yeah. Anthony Johnson was saying from a gamer's point of view, the argument is that allows us far more immersion and we can step into Isaac's shoes and immerse ourselves, imagine ourselves within that environment as opposed to being the puppeteer of a marionette. He was saying from the writer's point of view, it was an absolute nightmare. You don't have that problem translating the Resident Evil narrative to the big screen. There's lots of dialogue, whether it's be movie-esque type dialogue, Resident Evil, the characters do have a lot to say for themselves. In terms of the challenges facing the filmmaker that wants to translate this beloved series to the big screen, there's the lack of tension in the narrative because we're very familiar with the narrative if there's the plot armour that the characters are going to have. In your opinion, Sean, do you think there is sufficient plot and dialogue in the Spencer Mansion incident and the Raccoon City outbreak for a film? Or do you think, and was this perhaps the route that you were going down, that that would be better served, portrayed in an episodic format as a TV drama? Yes and no. You have a lot to explore in the mansion, or in some cases in in Robert's interpretation of the Spencer incident, you have a lot less. When you go through a game, as far as Resident Evil 1, the side character interaction is very sparse. You kind of have to start building ideas around how are these characters going to interact more, which helps the investigation, which helps develop these characters. But you don't want to hit your audience over the head with too much talking. A lot of the famous directors care about mood, atmosphere, long, low-burning shot that really create that world. Music, sound effects are probably more than 50% of the experience that you, that you should get. Picture yeah. is more supplemental because your imagination is really more important than what you can be seeing. What you think you're seeing is probably more interesting to me or what you feel. What was your overall vision for Arclay and what themes were you looking for to bring the audience of Resident Evil fans? Good question. When it comes to the overall vision, I just foresee it as a detective show that starts expounding on the existential horror of our reality as we know it. When it comes to unraveling these bizarre murders, we see a corporation with its foot in a moral gray area that does things that in a lot of ways benefit society, but um, there's a lot of corruption involved. It's another retelling of our reality, things that we don't perceive on its surface, but we know it exists. The kind of Black Mirror-esque without the overhanded sci-fi-ness of it. I wanted to show thematically elements of control, the horrors of the political corruption, the greed. greed. Yes, even the, the emotional side of how we handle our everyday lives with technology that a lot of shows already explore, but we're seeing it from a, a different horror that I think Resident Evil has always done. We just don't see it well enough on screen. It's fascinating to hear you say that because all of those themes I feel are lacking from the film Welcome to Raccoon City. You can quite clearly see it was made by a fan for fans. There's a great deal of love behind the film. But I think Roberts has constrained himself and had his own hands tied by this over-reliance of trying to portray both narratives on screen. Whereas it sounds like you freed yourself from that burden. Dave doesn't have any direct and specific examples of Resident Evil iconography or characterization. You're exploring the themes and a kind of freed yourself up from that to just actually explore the the themes that are so prominent and do resonate with us that are in the game. Yeah, I want to explore Resident Evil or the themes on a spiritual level, not necessarily literal, because it seems like the majority of people who've watched Dave that love it favor it because it's the tone that they want. It's the spirit of the game. And it's not about Redfield or Valentine. It's about the feeling that you get when you play the games. For me, that's what I really cared about, because when you're doing a proof of concept, not only are you visually trying to interpret how you want to show it, but you kind of have to explore how do these characters feel? How do they look? How is the chemistry amongst all of that? That's what I was just trying to do, and everyone loves it, so I guess I achieved the spirit of it. I couldn't agree more. Watching it, it very much has that feel, the atmosphere, the slow building tension. It feels like that survival horror experience put on the screen and feels so much more genuine in that sense than the films so far that have been greenlit that we have seen. 
I saw it when it first released. And I was one of those people that actually loved it. Because I've always been of the mindset of Resident Evil story would work out so much better if it was something along the lines of Outbreak. Just random characters trying to figure out what's going on and how to survive. And that's what kind of gave me the small vibes. Like the police force trying to figure out what's going on with these attacks. It's something that has the spirit of Resident Evil, but it has nothing to do with none of the characters. There's a Netflix series called Black Summer. A zombie apocalypse is happening. Nobody of these people know each other, and they're all trying to figure it out together. All of the things that you're talking about, that fear of the unknown, as uh, Batgirl mentioned, like Outbreak, where you're in the middle of a situation and nobody knows what's going on. It's following the, the investigations of these individuals is trying to figure out what the actual story is before yeah. we even get into this thing that everybody knows, this canon of the mansion and whatnot. You're exploring how all of that comes together to lead up to, I was flying around the forest zone. What happens before that moment? Overall, fans aren't asking for too much. I think they just want the spirit of it. And even if it doesn't have the characters, just slap Resident Evil on it, and people would actually like it more if it took care of its characters emotionally, the themes, in an outbreak, like you're saying. As an independent filmmaker, you don't have a company telling you, you have to include this, you have to cut this, you have to combine these characters, all these restrictions that a filmmaker like Paul Anderson or Roberts, yes. I'm sure they had those restrictions imposed on them as filmmakers making a movie for a company. Do you feel that that freedom has given you a license to explore and create parts of the story that people may not recognize as canon? Absolutely. When I set out to do Dave, I was the executive producer on it. So I did have the creative control and it allows you to do what you want. Anyone can write a good script if the studio just doesn't understand or you don't have a producer that understands their audience and how to translate that. It's very challenging for you as a creative person because now this studio exec wants this character or they want an unknown. Now all the stuff that you wrote could potentially be thrown because you had this really engaging thematic thing going on here it doesn't matter anymore and it's really irritating and it's very stressful so yes that's constantly happening within the industry we don't give enough credit to paul anderson or johannes roberts because no one wants to make a bad film when they make it but yeah. it's being juggled by so many people filmmaking is such an organic process if one person doesn't do their job well it might overall make the project really disappointing in terms of the acting, you can have the best script in the world, the tightest screenplay, greatly adept direction, but particularly in this type of genre, when you're making a short at this level, when I say this level, I don't mean it in a pejorative sense, you're looking to get something green lit. It must be quite a challenge to have the faith that they're going to be able to put this across in a, in a realistic way that means that us as the audience, they're going to have to take a step out of reality and put ourselves in this zombie genre, are going to find it genuine and are therefore going to really engage with it. And I thought the acting was absolutely fantastic yeah as a director your job is to find truth is to find honesty within the performances above all here here going back to the previous films of resident evil whatever your opinion on it is for example this director isn't good because the acting is bad here that might not dictate that the director doesn't know how to find it through acting it's just you have studio execs that are mm -hmm. constantly on you about getting this done as fast as possible you have writers that are rewriting pages that day you're waiting on those pages while you're on set you do not have enough time to find that truth in your performance i don't know what happened on welcome to raccoon city and my opinion about the acting there was is it shows it shows that they didn't have enough time i feel like it was rushed they filmed that movie and then almost a year later they had reshoots I don't know how bad that was on Roberts, but it's very easy to shit on a director because yeah. they're responsible for the entire film. We simply do not know what or why something bad happens. If more people understood how much work it was going to be, you'd see a lot less people getting into filmmaking because it's, it's too daunting. I think the fact that any film gets finished is a miracle. I've seen films start out with huge budgets. I mean, working in animation, I've worked at the biggest companies in the animation world, and I've seen films start off with a bang and go through six to eight years worth of rewrites and never make it to the big screen. 
Yeah. Millions and millions of dollars spent. I shouldn't say wasted. You spend all this money trying to develop something. And if at the end of the day, it doesn't get made, you can say that money was wasted. But really during that exploration, a lot of good work was done. And I think there's always a value to that. How closely one keeps the narrative of the video game and the characterization when you're translating it to the screen. The actions of the characters in the game, frankly, mostly amount to just shooting obstacles that are in front of them. You can't determine a fully realized character for the screen just from those actions alone. However immersive the Spencer Mansion narrative is, you're going to have to surmise what type of person would take up those in-game roles and then perhaps surmise traits that you would find within that person that are evident in the actual in-game play when you're doing that as a writer how close you want to keep or should keep to the video game counterparts in their actions and in their looks in terms of fleshing out the character and how much you would feel is necessary just to have the freedom to surmise what type of person and character traits someone who wanted to be a member of stars would have right so if people are anticipating a one-to-one -one ratio of the mansion on screen, it's not going to work because the mansion itself, it's designed to be very labyrinthian, very confusing, very disorienting with that effect because you as a player have the time, you have mm -hmm. the hours to spend to sprint around that place all day if you wanted to. With a film, you kind of have to zone in on what is most effective for your scenes and you kind of have to write around that those moments. If I read a script that has just a bunch of puzzles and then you have the room where the ceiling's coming down on Jill, okay, there might be a moment there. I like the intensity of this scene coming down because it kind of reminds me, and you know, Resident Evil takes other ideas all the time, but this one in particular, like kind of very Indiana Jonesy kind of like aspect, what's she going to do? How's she going to get out? Now, of course, we all know the ending to that scene, but I think you kind of have to take a lot of liberties, creative liberties for those scenes to come to fruition. If you want to see people die, that doesn't doesn't really happen in the game you kind of want to see that like for me i would love to see more deaths on screen with the game you don't see many deaths you see sullivan's death at the beginning but i would really love to see how these obstacles come into play the reality of these horrors in front of you but when it comes to the actual characters you kind of have to like test the barriers and see what works and what doesn't as a player all your mission is you try to figure out how to get out of this room as jill who is an expert she's a master of lock picking when it comes to the characters within Stars, Redfield, for example, he's from the army. Forrest Spire, he's a great marksman. Stuff like that. If you had to like sacrifice certain characters that you can't really see on screen very much, maybe give Jill. She's got a, a skill set in demolitions. Maybe she knows how to how to blow things up. Different tactics for Stars. So like I don't know, she's got C4. She blows something up to get down a different passage. There are monsters in the way. There are spiders coming at her. She's got to think on her toes, right? She's got to do other things. You have to think like creatively. What what I like to see happen, you kind of want to surprise fans as well. You don't want them to know what happens. When the tension is affected so much by the fact that these characters do have plot armor, if we are going to keep, and as Roberts did keep with the video game narrative, you've got to find the tension somewhere. I thought there was a shocking lack of death, blood and, and gore in, in Roberts' film. Yeah, Constantine executives that own the live action rights to the Resident Evil franchise, they're really careful about what they want to see on screen. They're from Germany. The Resident Evil games across the PAL versions, they are the most heavily censored in Germany. Because I think it was Resident Evil 2 and 3 where the blood had to be coloured green. The port version of Resident Evil 2, they changed the bloods to blue or green. You could select which one you wanted. Yeah, it's crazy. And I know even George Romero's script went through like five or six drafts and they were concerned with the gore. It got to the point where they liked a version of Romero's script, but Resident Evil 2 came out. Constantine basically were like, we love it, but guess what? We feel like it's outdated now. Then they had to like let him go, which is insane. That's insane that to me. Completely. I did want to mention that comparing the last iteration of the Resident Evil movies compared to the first one of the Anderson films, there is a scene where they basically mow down the whole squad. They basically kill off every single one of their soldiers, and it's that laser scene. They don't really pull punches when it comes to killing off characters. They just don't know if they're going to kill a character that people are just going to freak out. Yeah, that laser scene room basically caught everyone off guard because they were not expecting that kind of brutality. Everyone yeah. died. 
love it or hate that movie, that later scene is iconic in its own way. It is. Because Anderson does this, I, I would say he does it well in the first movie. He portrays terror in an interesting way. And in the first five minutes with the elevator in that movie is something that's really unnerving and really gross. These people just die. And you see it on screen, and you're so, you're so bothered by it, and you're wondering why. And yes, the people in the laser room, the guy that dies at the very end, you know, he was like moments away from living and he dies. It's that kind of punch that doesn't get pulled that bothers you. And I love that. I That's love it. that because it doesn't cut away and you show him spliced up and then it, it slowly like he falls, he falls away like a waterfall, like water. And you're just like, this is gross. He does that well. Those are probably one of the few things that I liked about it. In Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City, does Roberts rely on the video game to do the heavy lifting of establishing the film characters, or does his script adequately do this? How much should a Resident Evil screenplay rely on its audience being familiar with the characters as portrayed in the game, and how much should be originally developed on screen? So yeah, I think with Robert's film, in contrast to Anderson, you kind of have to know these characters in a way. With Chris and Claire, they are the foundation of the new film. They are the people in the spotlight. You kind of have to build that origin, and they, and they they take a unique origin with them. But with like Leon and Jill, for example, and even Wesker, they kind of just are. And what I mean by that is Robert's kind of has to like figure out a way to make it work when it comes to the, the origination of these characters too. But when it comes to the heavy lifting, yeah, it kind of does help that you know these games. Aside from the rookie aspect of Leon, which is he's good in the rookie aspect of a character who the audience member needs to get answers like, what's going on? What happened here? And even Anderson, his first film, there's a lot of exposition. So it does help that you know these games. It's hard for me to like recommend it because I believe that a film has to have its own footing. You have to find a good balance between make something fresh and to embrace the idea of bringing new moviegoers into the seats. You can't expect and assume that just fans are coming, which they will because they're fans. But if you want it to be successful and more people to come, you have to be open to the idea that it has to be unique. And with any adaptation, I was a big fan of the Dune novels way before the movie. And the fact that I had read all of the novels gave me uh, a deeper insight into everything that was happening on the screen. When I saw the original Dune, I really enjoyed it. People who had never read the books were like, what the F? I have no clue what happened in that film. And I imagine that it's the exact same conundrum when you're writing a, an adaptation of a video game. Not only are you trying to say, here's the story, but here's how I felt when I was playing the game. And that's going to be different for everybody. And if you haven't played the game, are you even going to understand what we're trying to do in the film? You, right. So the film definitely needs to have its own legs to justify itself as a standalone thing. Yeah, Robert's film has a hard time breathing, and that's because you jam-pack very big games, two of them, in fact, into one movie. Do you think that he should have not done Resident Evil 1 and 2 together? I mean, again, I don't know what happens behind the scenes. There's definitely enough information there to make a Resident Evil 1 film. I don't know what Constantine wants to do as far as if they want to make a new franchise or if they just want to make a simple movie for fans and then get started moving on something new again. But I truly believe that Resident Evil 1 and 2 deserve their own movies. Well, the characters in Robert's film, they really kind of felt a little bit off but Chris, because Chris seemed more like himself to me, because with Claire, she really didn't seem like the kid we know, because in the original, she's a college student, but it felt like in this one, she's an investigator. It kind of didn't feel right to me that she's like, oh, there's something going on, whereas I'm lucky for Chris. <laughs> Did you feel it was almost like the Claire that we know from the later games, the more experienced one that doesn't need the protection? Yeah, it's like they matured her 30 years and made her have a different objective. She's more like the... Uh, infinite darkness Claire than the young Claire who's looking for Chris. Had you not had this prior knowledge of these characters in this new movie, would you have liked them? That's the big question. Well, to me personally, the way they had Claire, it still didn't feel like she's in her own character to me because it just didn't feel right at all. Even if I didn't know her, the way they had her portrayed, it just didn't feel right. In other words, you feel like these characters are, are filling roles because they're supposed to be filled. Yeah. They don't feel mm -hmm. organic. Exactly. 
This was the first time that we got the stars, team members all together in one film. There has been changes to their video game traits, but more dangerously, their roles have changed. We see this with Claire and Jill, whereas we have Jill taking on the more caring role with Sherry and Claire becomes the more badass, toting, almost like mm -hmm. a, I've referenced Starbuck, where they had a female actor play Starbuck in the reimagining of Battlestar Galactica. But does this affect yeah. the narrative for the better or worse? And, and, and how does it affect who is your audience? Is it going to be the video game lovers? Is it, are you looking at just a wider audience? of horror fans in general. I'm just throwing questions out there for you guys to answer in a minute when I've shut up. Why no Barry? Uh, and some would say that Welcome to Raccoon City's greatest failings from many fans' point of view was in the characterization. That really did affect fan engagement, that they just didn't recognize their beloved characters on the screen, whether this was down to casting or script issues. Yeah, because when they first released the uh, images of the cast, everybody was asking, where's Barry? Uh, Barry, where's Barry? <laughs> you should have said that. Why not? Chris, over to you, Joe. Barry, where's Barry? <laughs> Yay. Wait, no. Oracle, did Joe give you $5 before the podcast to get you to make him say that? No. Well, from Robert's official response, he says that Barry deserved more of a spotlight, and that's why Richard took his place. Richard is Chris Redfield with a hernia. When I did his voice, because I did the voice of Richard as well. That's and, right, that's uh, right. The directors said, you know, we've got this other character that we need to do. Can you do a, a different voice from Chris? And I said, well, yeah, if this is Chris, then this is Richard. <laughs> and, <laughs> there you go. It's basically, there's a snake and I, I need serum. I mean, that's Richard. You know? <laughs> Are you ruining the magic? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is the magic. Wait, but Joe, you magic. told us you went and camped in an isolated mansion for like five weeks to get into character. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and Lawrence Olivier asked me if I should just try acting. Very few people will get that reference. Do you have to be over 40 to get that? Hoffman was doing Marathon Man. He went without sleep for days. And okay. Lawrence Olivier turned to him one day and said, my boy, why don't you just try acting? <laughs> Can you do the famous uh, Richard scream? The snake scream? I don't remember what I did. <laughs> oh, okay. It'll be part of the blooper reel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to <laughs> Obviously, Leon was the comedy relief in this film. I think goes far too far and just becomes a complete parody of himself to the point where his redemption with the rocket launcher at the end just doesn't feel earned at all. Mm. Yes, he's a rookie, but he's not an idiot. Without the inclusion of Ada, you just then completely remove a significant character journey for Leon, the significant part of his narrative. I wish and she was in here more often, but it sucks, <laughs> you know, because she's the key factor for Leon's character arc. Yeah. And they saved her for last for being Wesker's character arc. Well, Leon is a favorite of mine. I love his arc, as we all know, as a rookie, but he develops over time as this like really caring servant protecting, literally. In this, like you said, he is the butt of the jokes. Everyone hates him, even though he's completely nice. I did not like that, and it made me hate Chief Irons even more. Here's exposition to tell the audience what's happening. He was only there because he's part of the game. I'm impressed that he didn't die because he just has no significance overall in this movie. It wasn't deserved for him to be the guy to shoot. No. I think it speaks volumes of his depiction in the film that the fact that he looks the least like his video game counterpart yeah. more than anyone in the <laughs> cast is of very little relevance to me and certainly isn't the most jarring thing about the character portrayal on the film. Yeah, I think the initial casting release, a lot of people were surprised by that. I just feel like Resident Evil, the ensemble cast, honestly, there's too many white characters. And I understand that you have to have diverse, you have to create diversity within this realm. You have Claire, Chris, Jill, Leon, Steve, and Wesker. It's hard to balance that. And I don't think it's necessary to be really upset about changing the look of someone. As long as they're within the spirit of that character, it's fine. When it comes to going back to Leon in the movie, I felt he was just the guy to shoot the rocket because they needed something for him to do. Yeah. But it felt more deserved for Chris or Claire. And then Jill was kind of there too. She was just another filler. Jill was criminally underused in this. In my writing training, if you have a story that has an ensemble cast, every character is there for a specific reason in terms of they bring an aspect of perspective not just perspective but they are mm -hmm. there to represent if you have five characters one character represents innocence one character represents corruption each character is filling a personality niche within the overall character makeup of the film 
There's a reason these people are together as a group. As a group, they have a combined dynamic that is in the story because only with that combined dynamic can they achieve their goal. So every right. character has an important key to put in the lock that is the multi-keyed lock of the story. And if you have characters who are extraneous, who don't serve a purpose in a film, then you kill them off. You don't write a character that's just there to shoot a rocket. I can't imagine how difficult it is to write a screenplay for a video game when those characters are not there to fill a specific role. They're there to do a specific thing. And you're, as a writer, you're trying to figure out what their emotion is, what their reasoning is, what's the meta of their existence in this story. Yeah, I agree. But Every character in their game, those characters kill the bad guy because they are the protagonist. Thematically, they should be the one to pull the trigger because that's their ending. Yeah. Whatever you think about the first game, whoever Jill or Chris, whoever pulls the rocket launcher trigger, in two you have Leon and Claire, in three you have Jill. Jill is the one that pulls the trigger on Nemesis. I feel like to create a sense of character throughout the whole franchise, every character should have their own pull the trigger moment because it defines them, what they've had to go through every obstacle. And therefore with Leon pulling the trigger, it kind of undermines yeah, the there's main. no payoff. There's no payoff there's for Chris or Jill or Claire. You've taken that payoff away from the other characters. You don't get that character arc. It's almost just tick boxes. Here's Wesker. Here's Jill. Here's Claire. Here's some of the things that you love around them. So you've got the picture of the swordsman piercing the head and the belly that you've got in the Spencer Mansion. There's the little PDA that Jill and Wesker use that's from a, an S.D. Perry novel. But these are all superficial. There's, there's no real depth to it. Mm -hmm. And the one little pet peeve that bothers me is, where did he get the rocket launcher? Oh, it's just in first class. First class. That's it was just in his pocket. Oh, hold on, guys. I got something <laughs> special. And yeah. how did he know how to use it? This is a guy who admits, exactly. I, and, and I don't quite understand how he passed the cop exam <laughs> without, he actually readily admits that he doesn't know how to use a shotgun. Right. And he shot his own partner. Right. Dad's top-notch guy who's like, yep, yeah, my son's going into the police force. <laughs> but I don't know how to shoot a gun. He's the new spy for Ada. Who knows? Me, being a very big Resident Evil fan, I took my best friend who has not played one of the games. She absolutely adored everyone, especially Leon. Yep. Wow. She adored him, she adored everyone, and she's like, oh, I like Claire, she's really cool. And then I looked at her very serious and I go, that's not Claire. <laughs> and she goes, can you explain what do you mean? And I went in and I explained how Claire is portrayed to us as fans in the original. And I'm like, you have never seen Claire Redfield abandon her brother. It's usually the other way around. Chris is going on missions and she doesn't know where he is. And it kind of feels like the Redfields are beefing with one another. And it's like, that's not the Redfields we know. <laughs> But she adored it. She was like, oh my god, I love the movie. I'm going like, okay, that's good. At least you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Someone that goes in without the emotional baggage of maybe a preconceived idea of what they think Leon should look like and how they think Leon should act. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, Joe was asking the question, was it the correct decision to portray the two narratives, the, the Spencer Mansion and the RPD narrative into one film when just one alone would be hard enough? One of the criticisms of Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City was the time it took to develop the main premise, Evil Corporation poisons this innocent town. The depicting the consequences of the outbreak was delayed for the Claire and the Chris orphanage backstory. How long into the film or indeed the TV drama would you want to set the premise of this evil corporation responsible for a viral outbreak and would that then detract from perhaps what i think the point of the orphanage may have been so that we do have some kind of backstory biography that we can relate to so there's maybe a greater payoff at the end it really depends on what you're trying to say because you can write a whole season without showing the mansion it just depends on how much you care about developing these characters when I was pitching this, I usually called back to Batman Begins because Christopher Nolan, the filmmaker behind Batman, Dark Knight Trilogy, he kind of set it up so that you really cared about these characters well before they become those iconic within those movies. Batman didn't show up until like 45 minutes into the film. To me, that doesn't matter. Like, yes, I'm a fan of Batman. Yes, I'm a fan of Resident Evil, but I'm not going to be screaming at the screen saying like, I want to see these like moments. It has to be deserved. I want my cake and I want to eat it too, but mm -hmm. I don't don't want to eat it just because i want to go on like a two mile sprint to get to there because like i want to see these like cool like new moments so when the zombie turns his head for the first time it feels great it feels deserved if you show me that within five minutes i'm like there's no build up 
Dave was 12 minutes of buildup. We saw 12 minutes of these characters caring and cursing at each other about a brother who died, but we don't see a zombie until the very end. So I think that kind of dictates what really matters, that fans have to like really appreciate the things that they don't know yet and really relish on the new stuff and the refreshing stuff. And then talking about the orphanage, I think it was appropriate because, you know, as a film that was their origin, you kind of have to bridge the gap between one and two. I think it was nice that you kind of had this origin between the two, especially for like new audiences who have no idea who these characters are. You have the spark notes of who these people are. With the movie, thematically, yes, it's about family. I don't know if it was too long. Maybe my only note about it was I think Lisa Trevor was underutilized or or not utilized appropriately. But aside from Chris and Claire and the orphanage, I feel like the Trevor portion was underhanded. I don't know if it was really necessary at all. It was more authentic to the video game than any of the poor WSA Addison efforts, but poor in the execution and just completely nonsensical narrative choices let it down. It's such a shame because his heart is in the right place and he's doing the right things, I just think the execution is poor. You don't get that iconic zombie Mr. Lightbulb head until 54 minutes in. That then does give all that time for character build-up and then future payoff for various character arcs. So I think he got that bit right, but I think the execution just falls flat because we don't really get that character building and nothing feels earned at the end yeah because right. when you actually watch it it's at that moment things escalate very fast through the film it's like we're not actually getting paced it's just like let's do this let's do this let's do this get it done with because we're near the end and I, I honestly don't like it when it's getting close to the climax because when you rush through the scenarios it just feels so short because we don't have a build up to it yeah it's leading up to this but as soon as it happens it's like gone in 10 seconds yeah, Roberts, he wrote this in particular where it's like the title cards was saying what time it is. And I guess that was supposed to be the suspense. For me, it was kind of like unfulfilling. Like I felt like, oh, it's two in the morning. Okay, so we have four hours left before everything goes to some other rings. But I don't feel enough for what's on screen to build up to that point. The yeah, and, and then the next scene is like, it's 4 a.m. I was like, well, okay, what just I mean, happened? <laughs> Yeah, and then going back and forth between the mansion and the and the police station didn't really feel deserved. And again, yeah. like you said, rushed is the appropriate wordage. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, in terms of screenwriting, that moment, when you're halfway through a film, you've, that should be the moment when everything begins to uh, accelerate. That's one of the reasons it should not have been split into two different locations. The second act of a film should be the exploration of the fun and games of the film. That's the exploration of the mansion before it gets really serious, before the time clocks start running and you have to run to get to the roof to shoot the final monster. All of that should have been explored in the second act of the film, which means that the turning around of light bulb man should have happened in the first act. That should have been the catalyst moment. That should have been the break into two. That really is the thing that says, wait a minute, something crazy is going on in this house. Let's go explore it. Exactly. Mind, yep. That mashup of the two stories probably caused him, forced him to push that moment to the midpoint as opposed to earlier in the film. To piggyback on that, usually your act two should be the special world. Act one should be the development of these characters. Act two and the catalyst should present this new special world, which is taking them to the mansion the zombies start approaching the barricade in the front of the RPD. But I feel like those moments, yes, those moments are are your act two. There's that old adage of the first act is thesis, the second act is antithesis, and the third act is synthesis. So the first act shows the world as it is, the second act is the world because of this event, and the Mm -hmm. third act is what does the world become because of what happens in the second act? What does the character become in the third act because of the experience, because of the world that it came from, the world it was thrust into, and the transformation that happened? Now in the third act, you see that character act on that information, on that transformation. It's a shame because I feel like if you just added some new element, like the split in the midpoint, if you want a really engaging thing, one of your favorite characters gets bitten. From then on until the end, they have to look for the antivirus, which to Anderson's credit, yet again, the original movie, Rain, Michelle Rodriguez's character gets bitten. And that's kind of like your build up. You kind of have to like build up to this moment. Yes, you have the hive and the countdown, which is mm-hmm. constantly ticking throughout the whole movie, but you have certain characters that require the necessary things to recover from. So yeah, when it comes to Welcome to Raccoon City, it's just absent. 
kind of have like moments with Chief Irons, Donald Logue, which mm -hmm. I really like as an actor, but we focus too much on his departure. That's the only overall like sense of what's supposed to be happening, what Raccoon City looks like. And I guess that's enough for us to go back to the RPD. I don't know if that was too necessary because ultimately it goes right back to what happens. And mm -hmm. then you have, am I in charge or are you now? It could have just been re-edited, more reshoots, more changes ultimately. In defense of Johannes Roberts, this was a low budget film made at the height of the pandemic. And obviously we don't know how much that may have been a factor. I know in regards to a science fiction film that I was watching, science fiction drama series Foundation, for some mm -hmm. of the larger battle scenes, they were simply restricted in terms of how many actors they were allowed on set. And so mm. a couple of battle scenes that slightly jarred with me at the time thinking, oh, they felt a little bit underwhelming. I then found out, well, actually half the cast, they simply weren't allowed on the day and they just had to scale it down. They had no other choice. This John Carpenter, early 90s style cinematography that I think is very much evident and you can feel particularly in the opening credits and, and the start and the aesthetic. And that very much contrasts with the flashy, glitzy science fiction feel that the Paul W.S. Anderson era right. has. That style, that John Carpenter dialed back style really does help to mask the lower budget that Roberts had to contend with. Do you feel that that Carpenter-esque style is a better theme contextually for the Spencer Mansion and for Raccoon City than that Paul W.S. Sanderson crisp modern style. Absolutely. I think aesthetically, visually, it deserves that kind of a cinescope anamorphic style yeah. where everything's wide and expanded. To Robert's credit, one of the very few shots that I really love, and it's not even real, is the mansion, the establishing mansion shot. It looks eerie as hell. The woods look like Evil Dead. It looks great. But once you get into the mansion and the spliced uh, scenes going to various parts of it, it starts getting more low budget. I was still impressed with the actual mansion hall, the entrance of it itself. Yeah, yeah, um, it was yeah, all they had on set were the stairs leading up to the second floor and everything else was green screen. Really? Yeah, it was like the stairs and then maybe one candle, but everything else is fake. I mean, I guess that's where all the money went. <laughs> I don't know. They use the same system that they're using on uh, the Star Trek films now. You know, everything's being shot virtually. Yeah, and then there's a huge transition happening with the Unreal Engine into filmmaking, which is really crazy. To go back to your question, aesthetically, I love that look. And film always gives you that aesthetically pleasing look, that more dreamy, more picturesque feel, a lot more distortion, things in general that the Anderson films, the clean look, while thematically may have some sort of impact with the corporate feeling of it. When it comes to corporate videos in general, they like to have that clean, kind of sterile look, which might have been what been behind Anderson's pitch. Anderson used different lenses altogether. He didn't use any anamorphic. They're, they're called spherical lenses, which more or less take up the entire screen as opposed to the wider aspect of Welcome to Raccoon City. Interestingly to me, I feel like they should have swapped lenses. So it should have been in reverse. While Anderson's film, more production design, probably would have benefited more from a film look because I just like it. I just like generally. That's just a personal thing. But a lot of the Welcome to Raccoon City elements, like the interior design of the rooms, probably could have benefited more from a higher lens. So it takes a full frame because some of the locations were kind of questionable. Some of the light, while great in the mansion at the beginning, didn't really serve too much of a, a great purpose when you got to later moments when you have the characters that are, that are fleeing from the zombies. You have like maybe one or two light setups that are very kind of flat, didn't really work well. I did like the orphanage stuff in the beginning, very slow moving. But when it comes to the, the lens that they were used in Welcome to Rockman City, they don't elevate the film because the look of the rooms could have been much better. They had to cut back the DSLRs and halfway through the film and they, they lost the rental to their Cook Primes. Are you serious? <laughs> Not everybody will understand that joke. <laughs> I know the Cook Primes and all that stuff. <laughs> Camera geek stuff. Camera geek stuff. The orphanage thing actually kind of makes sense to me because we don't know what Claire and Chris did after their parents were killed. We don't know if they were put in an orphanage or they were taken in by other people or family. The orphanage mm -hmm. really kind of sets the balance that, yeah, they went to an orphanage together. And then if it is in Raccoon City, Umbrella controls everything in the city. We know that. So who knows what they could have done to them? And that makes perfect sense. That everything else yep. does not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because I'm one of those people that chimed and championed that the Lisa Trevor things didn't make sense. Yeah. And the absence of mentioning her parents or why she's below the orphanage or how did she get there. 
Because this entire movie could have just been based on the Trevor family, because since it's basically about family, well, let's set the plot for the Trevor family line, you know, because they're the ones who suffered the most. I enjoyed the orphanage. I think it's quite a hard time. Those flashbacks flesh out the characters. Yeah. It gave Chris a connection with the city, and then obviously that kind of fatherly relationship with Birkin. That added a new tension to, as we saw, that added attention to Chris's relationship with Claire, which only worked well because we don't get the Claire we should have done from early games. We get a more hardened Claire, so she was able to have that abrasive relationship with her brother Chris. But again, it just comes mm -hmm. back to how much of that you used to develop the character and at what point you then get to the action. Yeah, I thought some of the orphanage stuff was fascinating. Some of the shot works with Johannes does, he likes to have like the slow moving zoom-ins. I don't know if you follow his other work with Strangers Pray at Night. He does a lot of those like really interesting slow moving zoom-ins. And he does it again in Welcome to Raccoon City when Claire's like looking out into the forest and she's trying to focus in on someone that's standing out there. That was actually one of his better shots. I thought that was a fantastic shot. The victim that got hit by the truck standing there or not, you might see it, but you kind of don't. Those subtle moments elevate it for me. So that shot was great. I did not like that William Birkin was the end-all be-all, because mm -hmm. if we all started to think about it, Birkin worked with Wesker, and the Ashford, right. in the callback to the Ashford twins, amazingly great-hearted as it was, it made no sense. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to bring it up. I'm the Code Veronica girl, you know. <laughs> I know. I just seeing that didn't make any sense. It's like, okay, it, 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 why is Birkin no, there? It doesn't make like sense. Like the shot of him smiling doesn't really yeah. help. No, <laughs> because if you go back to Code Veronica, Alexia was Birkin's biggest rival until she went into cryogenic stasis. So it doesn't make any sense that he's there when they were created. It's fine thematically because you kind of have to find the through line about like who these characters are. But I think that's such a fan service thing to like yeah, throw I, in the Code Veronica stuff that it just doesn't matter. There was way too many scenes that were made as in fan service wise that just mm -hmm. right. didn't make sense for a lot of the storytelling they were trying to do. Yeah. One of the scenes that has been criticized being kind of cheap fan service, the itchy tasty scene, I felt what lies behind that isn't just sort of like a cheap cameo or Easter egg. Right. What I really enjoyed about Welcome to Raccoon City is I can't think of another occasion in a zombie genre where I've seen a slow, depraved confusion within a human that's slowly turning into a zombie. The woman, the itchy tasty woman is moaning, you know, what's happening to me? It almost always, it's always instantaneous. And yeah. the thing that I loved about the Spencer Mansion incident that you read in the files this human tragedy mm -hmm. as they're right. slowly slowly they're losing the humanity but there there's enough humanity there to articulate to us the tragedy and what's going on and then it just slowly and slowly and slowly gets more and more depraved as their humanity mm -hmm. gives up so i like that that we saw that with the zombies in in welcome to raccoon city i just wondered what you felt on that i don't know if it actually elevates the moment I appreciate callbacks, but I think, is this the director telling me, hey, look at how much I know. Do you like that? And I yeah. don't know if it actually translates well. I know a few of my colleagues and friends who thought that was funny, cringe funny, because yeah. it kind of didn't feel purposeful. And while I agree, The Keeper's Diary is fantastic. Yeah. I think it's such mm -hmm. a devolving element of story and character that I find fascinating. I just don't think it was necessary I guess I get it, what you're trying to do here, but it, I kind of rolled my eyes at it because I don't feel like it was purposeful. Maybe Roberts was like, this is essentially what I'm trying to tell you about these zombies, that they have these feelings too, and they're devolving into this thing. I don't think it comes off as a very like intelligent callback. A good idea lying behind not sharing an instantaneous metamorphosis, but a much slower, depraved one to really get across the human tragedy, but not necessarily done wrapped up in that cheap Easter egg way. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying I don't appreciate callbacks. It's just, it kind of looks very fan filmy. It kind of takes me out of it because I'm supposed yeah. to care about what's happening. But then you're like, oh, callback, here's a reference. And I'm, I'm not fully engaged. We were mentioning John Carpenter before, a technique that he's very famous for using, which was used in his film The Thing and Assault on Precinct 13, which would be absolutely ideal for the RPD scenario, was steady cam and long takes to establish the geography in The Thing. We've got the Antarctic outpost and then the police station in Assault on Precinct 13. Roberts was quoted as saying that he was very much looking at the Assault on Precinct 13 theme as source inspiration. I just didn't see that at all. Yeah, you get that fantastic set design and the RPD looks Looks brilliant from the exterior but the interior falls very flat and then the narrative within the rpd falls very flat 
Yeah, you can tell where they put more money into the establishment of RPD's main entrance, the entrance within the main hall itself. You could see like Leon sleeping there, which yes, it is fake, no surprise. It does kind of fall flat because it's such a flat aspect. And if it were more angled, then you can get away with showing the importance of the importance of the location. But the way that it was shot, it kind of like falls flat for me. But then you have you have shots where the stars room and then later uh, Chief Irons' his own room. It kind of looks like it was shot at different location and roberts he likes to shoot in those mobile homes like to recreate those interiors there it helps on budget and stuff like that but i don't know if it translates well into connecting the dots to the rest of the rpd the art designers adhered to many of the video game's smaller details in the form of easter eggs but lacking with the bigger picture of the interior set designs so much more authentic to the video game than any paul ws anderson effort but again the actual execution was poor with the RPD interior, there was absolutely no evidence of Robert's claim he received the blueprints for the Resident Evil 2 remake, Matt. And that was shown by the lack of recognisable iconic stars office, the overall empty school building feel, rather than the video game's grand art deco museum. The exteriors look fantastic, but where's that yeah. iconic looking stars office? We don't get that at all. Exactly, yeah. Um, the RPD outside, it looked incredible. And then you go inside and it just feels like it's completely flat. There's nothing else in there that... It's makes, just something. Make, yeah, it just makes us go, wow, it's really the RPD. And then you have the star's office, and the star's office just looks like a random generic 90s room. Messy. Yeah. <laughs> Did they spend their money wisely? Did they build practical sets until they ran out of money? Or was it planned from the beginning to be done with the digital set extensions? If that's the case, there's right. really no reason for those shots to fall flat because with the CG backgrounds, you could do whatever you wanted to do as long as you had a crew that was capable of doing it. And I'm certain yeah. that they had access to very capable technicians to make that come to life. When the zombie comes walking in on a flame into the entrance and she fires and shoots him down, it felt like that was, so I don't know if it was actually part of like a bigger place and then they just had to reshoot some of the reaction shots. Yeah, I have a very tight feeling about that scene because how can Leon sleep through a freaking explosion with two sets of doors open and it's right there in front of the building and he sleeps through that and they think it's because the music kept him asleep and the other thing that bothered me was why was he so tired? The, the Sony headphones, man. You, can, you, you just gotta, they're the best. Those are powerful headphones. Yeah. <laughs> Surely the heat alone. <laughs> well, you gotta admit, he can go sleep with those headphones on and not hear a freaking explosion but a gunshot wakes him up. He's hungover, he's late for work, and he sleeps on the job. That's your yeah. first day. What's wrong with you? In terms of the production and art design, one thing that I really enjoyed was the run-down, dying nature that we got of Raccoon City. I just saw the comparison of Umbrella contaminating the people with sort of American towns that have been poisoned by big corporations that have been illegally dumping chemical waste in lakes and hazardous chemicals underground. I just felt that gave Raccoon City quite a genuine in-universe feel and depth. At the beginning, those more kind of grittier, reminded me of Silent Hill Downpour, just that grittier, smaller feel that we had to the city. Yeah, it's depicted as a smaller town. Other iterations where you had Chicago, a much bigger, grander landscape exhibited in Anderson stuff. It works for Roberts because the whole premise of that film was like the city's kind of like a ghost town. I wonder if that had any had anything to do with the pandemic being the ghost town that it was. It's interesting to think about how the pandemic has hit this movie to its core. And now we come to our live watch of the Director's Cut of Dave, together with the privilege of listening to Sean Lee Burt's Director's Commentary, alongside our live watch-along. For those listening with us, you'll find a link to the film short in the description to this podcast. I'll give you a countdown from three, and if you hit the play button on time with the film volume muted, you can watch Dave whilst simultaneously enjoying Sean's Director's Commentary. If you now click on the link... To our upload of the director's cut of Dave, you should now have the film lined up, ready to play. Here comes the countdown. 3, 2, 1. Play. We got a gunshot victim at 4 Lincoln Lane. Roger on you, one to one. Uh, 
see already I'm intrigued it's fascinating you don't know who this guy is and just immediately you know <laughs> right within within seconds you already know he has a, uh, a, a huge medical uh, condition that we're obviously not aware of <laughs> amazing how just with that one thing you've immediately engaged my interest in a character I know nothing about straight away. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, obviously in the beginning we have a more of like a static uh, shots, more slow moving shots, basically just introduce the claustrophobic nature of his condition and where he's in, you know, the, his car and all that leading up to this. Rock, let me buy it, Brenner. Not so sure that's a good idea. You saw it? Listen. This isn't what you want to see. Don't. Let me the fuck go. Already we now know that there's a you know a link between the victim and you know an emotional link that that police officer obviously is aware of. Right, yeah, with the performances, I just wanted to establish a relationship between those two characters, that they already had a history, um, and with as little words as possible. I really like this actor, too. Where did, where, how did you uh, find this? PJ? Uh, his name is PJ. Um, I met him, like, years ago through another audition for a project, and we've been just um, in communication since, and he's just been fantastic. He loves the art um, and just love story and um, I just thought he was a perfect representation of Jim. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And she's perfect too. Really like the... Thank you. You knocked the casting yeah. out of the park. <laughs> yeah. She too. Like I've known her for years as well. Um, they're just good on screen. Like, what, yeah. what's fantastic about good actors is that if they are doing their job well, you don't actually have to uh, jump in and tell them what to do. Yeah. Um, as a director, for me, I like to just tell my actors to play. It's their playground. And if I have a problem with them playing, then I'll let them know. But otherwise, yeah. they can have fun. Glock's registered in his name. I was with him when he. I just love that shot of his face because you can see his eyes filling up with tears. Burglary doesn't. <laughs> yeah, I love that shot so much. You, you get a little bit, a little hint um, of what it is, but not enough to to, re to reveal what's later. Find the other cigar. What cigar? Check the humidor. There should be two missing. Maybe he smoked alone. No, he didn't. There were party favors, something he offered special guests. Scotch. You really got the uh, original game vibe with that shot from the top of the stairs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we were lucky with that shot. Um, it, this cabin actually had a, a second story, you know, as you see later on. But uh, we thought it was a, a great establishing a master shot, if you will, uh, of the of that location and just it fit. It was directly comparable with those Hitchcockian fixed camera angles. The unknown entity spying on you that the protagonist isn't aware of, looking directly down from a camera angle high up. Absolutely fantastic. This is my brother. Was that something you were particularly mindful of, Sean, to maybe get a couple of those kind of sort of comparison shots no. in? Yeah, I mean, I definitely wanted to to, to give you a, like a little taste of like how things work um, visually with, within the film that, um, you know, translates from the game um, from time to time. But not over, you know, overhanded too much, you know, because it's not about 
those it's about these characters. Are you aware that his former partner is suing him for five million dollars? What? Look, you know, if it's not on the board, I can't play it. And right now, nothing on the board says anything other than what this looks like. But it's what we were talking about before about the callbacks in Resident Evil Welcome to Wrecking City and whether they're kind of like My Easter interview. eggs and it was interesting points that you were making sure that they kind of don't really engage you, almost take you out of it because it's almost like the director saying, hey, you know, look what I know. Whereas what you've done there, it's brilliant. It, it, it's kind of a theme that we enjoy from Resident Evil without it being an actual specific, you know, on the nose direct reference. You know, obviously it's about these characters um, and the camera's obviously fastened to them, but I think psychologically, cerebrally, you kind of pick up on those elements. Like you see pictures, paintings within the cabin that kind of feels off. There's an odd painting to the right with a woman with a scythe, stuff like that, that like is kind of, is kind of eerie. Sean, it must be so difficult to get the balance between on the nose and in our face that we're going to notice immediately the first time, just to have that subtle kind of throwback, the iconology, without ramming it down our throat. So I think you found a perfect balance. I didn't notice it on the first viewing, but on the second viewing, ah, there it is. And it, it almost becomes more satisfying. You have to kind of search for these things. You're not consciously looking at them, but then subconsciously there's a spark and it resonates. And I just think with that, let you know, hammering it home, there's more value to that. And it actually aids the narrative. Even the lamp on his desk has, it's, it's, it's made of tree limbs. You see it. And it's like weird. It's like a weird, like thi the thing kind of element to it yeah. that was visually startling but it still fits <laughs> it, you know it still works are you ready for this vic looks like david michael reinhardt yeah the brother we're gonna need forensics on this uh oh here we go What did you shoot on, Sean? Uh, we shot on the uh, the red, the red epic um, yeah. camera, with like right. a a dragon extension. I, I I don't know if you're too familiar with that, um, but yeah. it's like a, an extension to that allows you to shoot in like six K resolution. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, I, I didn't master it in six K, but um, um, you can see it on YouTube. I think that's regular like 1080, but on Vimeo you can see it in 2K. Slightly more success than George Trevor. He's found his light, although his doesn't work. We were talking before about the, the subtle iconography and the subtle callbacks to the Resident Evil narrative, but clearly with that letter, you're very much stamping your mark that this is connected to the Resident Evil narrative. Clearly, this is tying specifically, not just the, the narrative in general, but obviously these specific characters involved. We're not sure whether that, you know, how far up Umbrella that reaches. But yeah, I like the fact that it's that direct, but at the same time, so many questions in terms of how specifically was Dave involved? Is he quite high up in terms of the ranks of the virology development? Yeah, it's just, uh, that's more obviously a direct representation of how it's linking to Dave um, and what's his, what his actual involvement was a little more vague in the Dave uh, version of it, but we get a more, a better idea of what he might be involved in. And then it comes back to finding the actual cigar that was missing. So obviously Jim and Dave know each other very well, so it makes sense for him to possibly place it there may or may not have been Dave. The ammo disc. Right, it's another callback uh, to the ammo disc. He's, you, I don't know if you can see it in this, but um, it says Sony right there, which is uh, just a funny, funny element to it. It's great. Nice. I just love the setup that he thinks it's an intruder. We're considering it might be something a little bit more sinister and 
just waiting for that to play out and the revelation. Right. Know, yeah, I mean, Jim is obviously on his toes much more than the other ones, um, being his brother and all, so... And this is what he finds. This is a great shot. Oh, man. The visual effects are spot on. Really good. Stunning. Thanks. Damn. Wow. I have to say, it's just so much more just unnerving that he's just, you know, staring and just standing there completely motionless. Almost you can see a, 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 an intelligence still remaining behind the eyes, emphasized by the fact that his brother immediately personalizes this zombie with the name Dave. Horrendous injuries, yet you can clearly see his eyes. And I think that's so important. Brother to brother, they're looking each other in the eye. Who's going to make the first move? Even when you're on set, you're kind of like hoping that it translates well and the impact is there because that moment is startling enough that there doesn't have to be motion. It's just the surprise, that twist that hooks you in even more and you just don't want to pull away from that with other distractions. So I thought it worked. Well, you did a really good job with the music and sound at that point too because the music slowly ramping up. You almost get a sense of even though that character is standing there and not moving, he's obviously in extreme distress because of the physical situation that character's in. But the mm -hmm. music ramps up just a little bit and then you cut and you almost get that sense of the music creating the tension that would launch that character into motion. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's a great point. You cut to the uh, the card, so you don't get to see the motion, but the music almost insinuates that the character's mm -hmm. about to move. Yeah, the next frame is about it defines yeah, what's going to happen next. You know, yeah. And I take that away from you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason why we want more. <laughs> yeah. It's also one of those elements that you can pull also straight from the games. We all talk about the atmosphere that the sound effects play key roles within the games. Sure. The music in, in this kind of pulls you in from the beginning. Even feel the atmosphere just changing yes. with the music changing. I'm glad. I'm glad that worked for you guys. Um, music, sound effects, atmosphere itself is more than 50% of the final picture. And I feel like once you attach some music, it kind of depicts what you're supposed to feel. And to go back to your point, Joe, about how the, the music ramps up over time, we've tinkered around with like a lot of elements. And one of the portions of it is that there is more or less a ticking clock that is happening throughout the whole picture. You just yeah. have to either see it or feel it or hear it. And then by the end of it, you know, it's kind of like this heart just stops stopping you know stops pumping then you just feel it we play a lot with camera tricks and stuff like that where like depending on certain characters what scenes are involved for example with uh, the woman detective if she's bigger in frame that suggests that she's kind of winning the situation and then you have jim who's in the kitchen very small he feels very small his world is kind of like ramping up on him um he's very constrained it's very claustrophobic these elements that all are represented well within film help you identify how these characters these persons are feeling i'm just blessed that you guys love it so much is it implied that Jim may be infected or sick with maybe cancer? Is that why he's probably like coughing so much and taking medication? Yeah, so he has an obvious medical condition, um, and that's part of the overall series. And I just kind of wanted to sprinkle that in there. We don't know where his pills come from, at least yet. They're directly involved with something or other that's connected to the bigger mystery that uh, may be answers for Reinhardt, or at least crumbs for Reinhardt to uh, investigate these crumbs to the culprit. Literally piece by piece. Yes, literally eating them piece by piece. <laughs> I wanted to explore the illnesses, uh, of illnesses in general, and how it impacts that world. And I think that's definitely um, an area that is so interesting to me because Resident Evil is all about Umbrella, who's all about fixing things. And seeing characters have all these flaws and looking for something to fix them is so compelling to me to see how these characters interact with companies like Umbrella. How do they see them? Yeah, it's a totally germane question for today's situation with uh, the public dealing with these companies that are making medications that treat things. I mean, look at what the Sacklers and Purdue just went through with the opiates. On one hand, you've got people who are experiencing this pain and the drug does help, but at the same time, it destroys the human being. And it's kind of like the umbrella situation of, do you go to umbrella? If you know that umbrella has something that will treat your diabetes, do you go to them knowing that they're also responsible for these horrible other experiments that are going on that are destroying lives? It gives you a uh, right. another moral conundrum for the character yeah. 
going back to the whole Dave as a series, yeah, these all these characters have issues when it, whether it's directly or indirectly. Maybe they have a loved one that that needs medical attention and stuff like that. And when you come to a city where it's being monopolized by certain corporations and you have to take certain drugs that could otherwise be the death of someone that you know, it's very eye-opening about what people do to live. If these medicines do work for them, do they start supporting Umbrella, for example? Right. Then there's a you moral know, judgment to be made. Yeah. And then the whole idea of misinformation, true information, what's real and what's false, you know, the social media recognition of it. What's have, true and what's marketing. Yeah, exactly. That's also another theme that I wanted to explore. What interested me about your answer to Oracle's question, often we see character flaws are represented in terms of personality traits, obstacles they've got to get over in terms of their objectionable parts of their personality. But I just thought it was interesting that you took something isn't fantastical. It's not the T virus. It's not the G virus. It's an everyday thing that people have to live with, diabetes. And it would be interesting, as I said, it's normally character traits people have to get over. But in terms of Mm -hmm. as the series developed, how that diabetes would impact on his day-to-day life, the challenges that he would have, whether, you know, he was irresponsible with his medication, Mm -hmm. burning the candle at both ends and, and kind of an extra dimension to the character i just would find interesting yeah so as a video game series you have the t virus the g virus etc which are basic representations of situational illnesses you know traumatic occurrences within that world that people are trying to look for answers antidotes antivirus and we already have that in the world when it comes to other illnesses you know things that are just leached onto us that we're stuck with for life for some people and that they are looking for answers and that needs to be explored brilliant I love this because of the uh, grill scene you had. I always find it as a nice test because you're actually given the detective to investigate something because of our human nature. We're always curious and checking into stuff. And I always found it normal that he would actually open the grill and discover the item inside. What was your inspiration for that? Not a huge amount of inspiration, just some guy that uh, it's... Was it's just big- curious? More or less, it was kind of like a note for me about how, like, what was one thing that Dave and Jim had in common, or at least remembers, and the significance of of his brother Dave. And you could assume he and and Dave had a lot of grilling evenings on the porch and stuff like that. And it was really uh, symbolic in that nature. And he got emotional over that moment, you know, if you rewatch it and see that. Uh, it was a very uh, tangible aspect to the film. And lo and behold, it was the piece of information that Jim needs. So did Dave purposely put that there? I mean, that's up to the viewers to decide. And then the the famous Grim Rasputin is dead, that piece of clue, which is basically, in other words, to to suggest that the case is still open and that fans, if you know they're interested as well, they can continue the investigation at GrimRasputinIsDead.com. Nice. That's a big revelation because we all know what the MO discs mean. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I love the viral marketing. So I wanted to incorporate that in some way. There is the Grim Rasputin is dead.com, which people can play to continue the mystery. Whether or not that actually has answers, I'll leave that up to you to investigate. But the Grim Rasputin is dead is something I just came up with when I was creating this. Definitely, it will come back in continuation with these storylines. I think that's a really interesting angle to continue pursuing and whether or not that has direct connections with these characters. That's something I'm still trying to figure out. Your screenplay isn't constrained to the video game narrative. You've got your own creative freedom, so you can produce better characterization. You can produce a better script than another director that may have tied himself to the video game. Because you've got that freedom, you can now present us with different characters, yet characters, though, that possess some of the same attributes that our beloved characters have in the game. So I'm sure if we were to see this progressed, we would maybe see similarities in the two characters in Dave that we see in in our beloved characters from the video game. But you've got the freedom to push that forward. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about it is that Chris Redfield and Joe Valentine, yes, they are video game characters, but they're living and breathing, and you can translate that very well. In Jim, I see a lot of Chris. In Samantha, the female detective, I see a lot of Jill. They're independent. They stand alone from those characters, and you were able to do that. You had the creative freedom to do that because, you know, you didn't tie yourself. You're not too, right. I'm going to do an out-and-out carbon copy of the video game narrative, and I'm going to just try and translate that to the screen. The narrative that keeps that closely, I don't think, is going to translate well to the big screen in any way. Mm-hmm. Robert's film, had it been just like about Resident Evil 1 or, or 2, it would have had more breathability as far as these characters and their investigation. I feel like that would have worked very well because you already see a uh, great uh, involvement with uh, Robert's like slow moving shots, you know, of the city, of Raccoon City. It's all there. I just think, you know, it just comes down to the amount of elements that are in the movie. 
It's hard enough to establish a character and then to do that in a way that's going to get viewer engagement. You know, you had 12 mm-hmm. minutes. And just what I loved was you've got immediate character establishment and interests. This kind of, for me, was sparked through the very tense interaction, you know, between the opening two characters. Just mm-hmm. incredible that within that those 12 minutes, interested in kind of the backstory, what's going on with his health and, you know, what's the relationship with Samantha. Just so many questions and, and interest sparked within such a short space of time. When you kind of build like a Bible for a show or, or a series, you kind of have to like figure out these characters, what their histories are, what they're going through. This would probably take place much later in, in the show, potentially, because you kind of have to build. It would be kind of cool to build the Dave character even more. I thought the zombie effect was on a par with anything I've seen Greg Nicotero in The Walking Dead. There was that kind of unique stillness. Almost showed that there was quite a lot of remaining intelligence. It didn't look like a completely brain-dead zombie. It was quite terrifying. Almost almost felt like there was a lot of Dave still in there. Right. I mean, that's at least that's what Jim is hoping too. I think what's really interesting and compelling zombies is that there are elements of that. Um, even in Resident Evil, you kind of have that. And what's so unsettling for us as as people who love horror is that we kind of like irks us a little bit. You know, it bothers us. Very unsettling that our loved ones get taken away from us in such mm. a brutal way. But you see all those layers come off one by one. Yeah, that's really the moral question of it, isn't it? If there right. is a remnant of the person still in the zombie, then we should be trying to help them. You strip that completely out and you just make them something that can be killed with impunity. It removes a layer, it removes a level of humanity from Mm -hmm. what you're doing as the player because there's now doubt. There's now, uh, am I killing someone who is cognizant of the fact that they are a zombie? (laughs) Right. And I think what's so interesting about this current situation is that Jim and Dave are brothers. The idea of trying to pull the trigger on your brother, even if you have some sort of yeah. idea that he could still be in there, he could still recover from this. Yeah. It's a hard decision. It kind of feels like a telltale kind of like decision. What would be the ideal recipe for the perfect Resident Evil film that's going to you know satisfy all the fans? And I was thinking to the first Silent Hill film, correct me if I'm wrong, received relatively good positive critical and fan response, despite having in-game contradictions. But its overall theme and its overall aesthetic was still considered sufficiently close to the game to appeal to most fans without irking them that they had those little in-game contradictions. This is where you're one, you would want to go with Dave in terms of mm-hmm. how closely yet how independent you keep away from the Resident Evil narrative. Going back to the Silent Hill thing, I think that's visually that representation is pretty spot on. The camera work, the the cameras themselves giving you the idea of what and, and how Silent Hill should feel like. They knocked out of the park with that one. Where you would like to now go with Dave, do you have kind of sort of f- further stories that you would like to develop? What would be the next step for you in terms of progressing this further as a production? Dave itself, it's a proof of concept of a series that I've put together as far as like I have a series of Bible for arcs for the characters. Um, it's just a matter of getting it off the ground and proceeding it. So I have a 60 minute pilot for TV that's still on the table, it's just a matter of getting it off the ground. Are you pitching? Yeah, I'm currently pitching it. So it's, it, it is exciting. You did such a good job with this one. I can't wait to see anything else you do. Thank you. And I can't My... wait to be in anything else you do. <laughs> <laughs> My writing friend and I, we've played around with an idea for a Dave 2 if for some reason we just wanted to do another short. We have an idea for it, and I think it might be even more interesting. Okay, so you've listened to us discuss and debate what makes the perfect Resident Evil movie or TV series, ranging from the Paul W.S. Anderson era. That's the word I'm going to use, no profanity on this podcast. Johannes Roberts's Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City. And of course, our very special guest, Sean Lee Burtz, as we've all agreed, truly fantastic Resident Evil art play film short, Dave. But now it's time to listen to your views. We put out a request for your call-ins and you didn't disappoint. Thank you so much to everybody that submitted a call-in. So we're now heading down under to the land of Australia for the views of the wonderful Happy Smelly. Resident Evil has come to life on the screen so many times now, and I'm so happy that we're now well beyond the Anderson years. While the movies with Mila Jovovich have had some choice moments, they were self-indulgent garbage fires that I'm happy to see the back of. Degeneration is my favourite movie, thanks in large parts to its excellent Claire Redfield and generally feeling like the only sensibly written Resident Evil movie. 
Damnation and Vendetta are both more confusing and frustrating than enjoyable for me, and Infinite Darkness and 4D Executor are hardly worth mentioning. Welcome to Raccoon City seems to me to be the most genuine effort so far to recreate what it feels like to enter the survival horror. The concept for Arclay showed a lot of promise, and I would really love to see a similar series centered around the RPD in the weeks leading up to the Mansion Incident with all of our favorite Raccoon City residents and Raccoon City evils. I loved the Resident Evil 2 trailer directed by Romero, and while his script had issues, I think his version would have been a lot of fun. We're yet to see a movie with Hunters, Neptune, Yawn, Plant 42, or The Magnificent Tyrant. Most Resident Evil films struggle to really hit the nail anywhere close to the head, but you have to admire them that they keep trying. Yeah, somebody will get it right eventually. I love the the idea of showing the citizens and the the officers within the RPD and building up to the moment where an outbreak occurs within the city. That would be a fantastic idea for um, a series because you start exploring all these characters, the conspiracy theories behind you know what's involved, and again, really relevant to today, like what's what's real and what's not. It gets you really paranoid about you know who to trust. Yeah, and I'm sure you would see that same kind of paranoia and tension building up within the police department. The tension would ratchet up and ratchet up from there as more and more victims were being found. And this is not clearly the work of a single person or a serial killer. I imagine as the corpses and the bodies that they're finding are becoming more and more mutilated. And, and like you say, what's real, what's not real. Mm -hmm. There's a much larger story there. You know, I think if they ever want to make a good Resident Evil movie or one that's really true to the source material, and I'm talking about the games, I think they need to get Shinji Mikami and get the guy that originated it, get the guy whose original vision it was involved in, in recreating that for a film. I, it feels to me like all the films were like, here's a, uh, here's a setup. There's an evil corporation that's made these uh, drugs mm -hmm. go. You know, these people were not fans of the games. They were not at, they didn't set out to make something that resonated with the game players and something that, uh, not itchy, tasty. What was her name? Itchy, smelly? Happy, Happy smelly. Happy smelly. I did ask you know, her the other day and she came into one of our streams where that name came from and she just said it was a long story. <laughs> they all, they all are. <laughs> Towards the end, she said, it's heartening that people keep trying to make these films. This most recent one is probably the closest thing that they've come to. But until they really go back and source that original concept of what made Resident Evil 1 so successful and so effective, they're not going to catch it in the films. Maybe we're sitting here talking to the guy that's going to do it. The only thing that I've seen on the screen that, that does that is Dave. Oh, well, thank you. I'm just a Phil Baker who just loves this source material, but we really have to give credit to it, Stu, and Mikami really brought that, his vision. So, and Iowa. Uh, can't forget that guy. Oracle Dragon makes a very good point. Kenichi Iowa was very much responsible in many of the themes that I think a lot in the community think originated from Shinji Mikami. A lot of his original themes were more along a science fiction and a fantastical narrative. And it was Kenichi Awa that very much kind of reigned into a more investigative story that involved these survival horror elements that we've come to love. I would actually really would love to see the story about the Trevors. Yeah. The creation of the mansion, what George Trevor went through, what his family went through, the experimentations and stuff in his final moments. I can actually see what the ending scenes would be for a Trevor story. Basically, George Trevor finding his grave and then everything fades to black. When it comes to Lisa Trevor and the Trevor family, it's so tragic. Seeing that on screen, I would love to see that. I wouldn't mind even seeing the Trevor family as backstory within the Resident Evil 1 movie itself. Mm -hmm. Because you, mm -hmm. Lisa, Lisa Trevor is such an, a great character, a great enemy that you face that it deserves to be explored. As a player, you're kind of investigating her story as well. You kind of you want to know the truth. And she's kind of there to be that vessel that you demand to know the answers and get answers from. I don't know if it was cut from Welcome to Raccoon City, but obviously we don't get a whole lot of Lisa Trevor and, and her backstory. But again, thematically, it's all about family. So it would have been nice to see see more. What was her purpose? What was her role in the film? It was almost again, just ticking boxes. You know, I'm a fan of Lisa Trevor, so I've got to put her in the film. But what I did think that Johannes Roberts did well is the fact that she is a victim and she's not an antagonist. Yeah, you can sympathize with her. She's not just a villain. You have to learn that history. It's, it's very heartfelt. I'm with Happy Smelly. Degeneration is my favorite. And the Romero script was did have its flaws, but I really would have loved to see it. It's one of those things that kind of got stolen from us. 
I'm definitely with Happy Smelly with regard to the Resident Evil CGI film. I've always been a fan of the first one, Degeneration. I think as they kind of progressed, they got almost more and more fantastical. And I've heard it mentioned that the audience in Japan don't look for the kind of the realism that we are. And I know that in Vendetta, it jarred with a lot of us that Leon was, you know, smashed into, a, I think it was an articulated lorry. And I think it plays differently. I've heard it plays differently to a Japanese audience in terms of those over the top stunts, whereas a Western audience is kind of looking for kind of more realism. I think she's very harsh with regard to 4D execution that I'm a big fan of. Okay, well, we're going to go on to the next call-in. From the First Aid Spray team, we've got a good friend of the show. We've got Fire Button Steve. Hello, Crimson Head. It's Steve from First Aid Spray. I hope you're all doing well. So, Resident Evil movies. Boy, that is a loaded topic you are asking me to pontificate about. My favourite, personally speaking, is 4D Executor, and I'm not even sure that qualifies as a film. I think the other CGI films are a bit naff. Welcome to Raccoon City. I've finally seen it. Safe to say it was a solid okay. It's strangely in that realm of a film that I am not upset about, nor do I really care about. I like some of the actors and their portrayals. I, li I like the concept of Wesker being a bit more complex than he was in the original game. That being said, you can tell that Sony clearly didn't give a damn about it. The marketing was pretty rough. The budget was clearly lighter than anything Paul W.S. Anderson had to play with. Kind of rough. And the less said about Paul W.S. Anderson's uh, fan fiction for his wife, the better. Now, regarding Arclay, Dave, I think that was actually a fantastic piece. Props to Sean and the rest of his crew, because making a, a Resident Evil mystery, a film about a mystery, is more compelling to me than let's just have some person dressed up as the characters we know shooting monsters. Having something to sink your teeth into. I don't know if it was the tone you were going for, but it reminded me of stuff like Scandinavian crime dramas like The Killing, only with uh, Resident Evil touches, and that's fantastic. That's not what everyone's in Resident Evil 4. Some people are just there to see characters blasting monsters, but I, I love it when there's a good mystery and a good conspiracy. In a way, it kind of reminded me of Biohazard at the beginning, Chris Redfield looking into the death of Billy Robertson, which predates the original game, or is like meant to be a prequel to the original game. If nothing else I can do is heap praise, because honestly, that 12 minutes may be my favourite live-action Resident Evil type thing I've seen ever. And that, that's probably harsh to some performances, like Caius Godelero as Claire and so on, but no. Jim, struggling with what appears to be a lot of problems, and you know, not only the death of his brother, but in general doesn't seem to be liked by his colleagues, and apparently, I want to say, a drug-related problem? Although I suppose that could have been a narrative hook for later. There's, there's a lot of meat in our clay. So my question is, if Constantine Films can't let you do what you want to do, will we see something of a spiritual successor to our clay? Would that ever be a thing you would like to do? He always has some good pointers. Yeah, there's some uh, good questions. Yeah, we talked about very loosely, very briefly about um, doing an adaptation that, or more or less an original version. Dave is basically that original concept without any kind of connections directly. But um, I appreciate the connection that he made to The Killing Show. As usual for me, a show or any movie has to have its own legs. It has to be strong on its own. And then when you incorporate any direct connections to something else, if it's an adaptation, then it has to have not only the meat of its originality, but then give it that cake that other people are looking for when it comes to zombies or, or characters or shooting things. It deserves that. So I really appreciate that connection that he made. I appreciated the point that Steve made with regard to Wesker. It would be very easy again, as of later, just to put in this mustache twirling evil antagonist. Initially, it kind of jarred with me when Wesker, he's in the cafe and he's almost the butt of everybody's jokes. I just found it more interesting that we kind of got a lot more to him than there is in the video games, targeted as the weak link within the group. And that's how the rival company got to him. Yeah, I think the portrayal of Wesker, as far as building him out as a character, I think is very interesting. The origins of him, so to speak. I think we talked about this in part one very briefly, that Wesker, if Dave were to get the rights to Resident Evil, that he would actually be a character and you would actually explore why he has to wear sunglasses, as opposed to just being a badass dude in Resident Evil. You see why he wears sunglasses. And for me, and going back to the whole theme of people exploring medicines and stuff like, what if it was a condition, an eye condition that he had, he needed to wear sunglasses? I was actually um, pointing that out to a friend of mine that we were talking about Wesker wearing sunglasses. I said he could have like a type of light sensitivity that he has to yeah, wear on right. at night. He's photophobic. He could explore that as a condition. And that's why he's so compelled about Umbrella's connection to healing and, and saving people's lives. He, he could Go be ahead. hoping for a therapy that would help him. 
Right. So I, I think there will be supporters for Umbrella. I think the games kind of just basically make Umbrella. It's it's basically good versus evil. But I think there's way more of a gray area in life that I think people intend to do good things with medicine. I'm sure there are Umbrella employees that really care about medicine and taking care of people. And But then there are other people within that system that are corrupt. But I think if you look back at Wesker and maybe he starts believing in this, in what they want, what they're striving to do, and you give him something like a cure for his eyesight, you know, and then he starts, you know, rooting for that side, he starts investigating them and then becomes part of that. There are a lot of things that do with Wesker that I think they tried to incorporate into this new movie. And I like that more. Steve mentioned 4D Executor, Biohazard 4D Executor, and whether that counted. And I'm a big fan of Biohazard 4D Executor. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, Sean. It was, how would I describe it? It was almost like a Universal Studios type ride where you're watching something on the screen and the chairs that you're sitting in kind of move, you know, in relation to, you know, what you're seeing. It was originally shown in, in Space World in Japan, CGI, just under 20 minutes long. It involves a BOW that slowly takes out a platoon of UBCS forces. I absolutely love it. Yeah, I'll have to look at that. Thanks, that was a fantastic call, Steve. And now we have a call in from That Bloke Tor. Hello, Crimson Head. It's Tor here. I wouldn't like to say that Welcome to Raccoon City was a bad movie, but only because in terms of sitting down and enjoying a film, it did its job absolutely fine. But I don't feel like it was a good Resident Evil movie. It reminded me of one of those horror parody movies where they take lots of bits and pieces and references from popular horror movies and sometimes other genres that preceded it, squish them all together and add a layer of humour, which often leads to the plot being a little bit all over the place, too much going on, humour in strange places, and that's absolutely fine if the purpose is to create a parody. And of course, it's not like Resident Evil always takes itself super serious. It's a really serious story if you look at it on paper, but a lot of the games, you know, they have that little wink to the camera. They have that camp dialogue. It does have a little element of theatrics in there, but I think that there's a way that you can incorporate that in a cinematic experience without it crossing the line of feeling like a parody and without it crossing the line or feeling like it's doing too much. It's not necessarily a bad movie, I just feel Resident Evil deserves better than what Welcome to Raccoon City served up. Another great call in, thank you Tor. Welcome to Raccoon City kind of felt like a parody with a lot of humour and stuff. Having just come from seeing The Batman, there is a moment of humour in that film, which is an extremely dark film. I think is a perfect example that you can have a light-hearted moment within a very, very dark film. You can also bring the point of the Dark Knight with Heath Ledger's Joker. The Joker is a very kooky, crazy character. Yes. But there's that scene in the hospital with Harvey and yeah. Harvey flipping the coin. And you have that moment of humor of him just walking away from the hospital and him just yeah. smacking the controller. And then, you know, the implication, you know what he's doing. It's yeah. something really dark. And then out of nowhere, it's like you're laughing because he's just clowning around with the remote but at the same time it's completely disturbing yeah i think everything deserves to bring some sort of levity to their piece like if it's if it's very one note and very dreary very dark the whole time without bringing any kind of like comedic relief to it then people might not like it it develops an additional layer to the piece that people actually appreciate life has full of comedy in the darkest places whether we not like it or not but people will get go there if they want to Everyone has their own interpretation of Resident Evil, whether or not it's it's intentionally supposed to be funny, spoofy, or very serious, whether or not you're on the fence if Resident Evil, the original, was supposed to be funny or not, or if it was just interpreted incorrectly through their vision. You gotta love the fact that some of those scenes are, are very funny when you play it through as an adult. For example, like the scene where you actually kill the snake and Barry comes in and goes, Jill, you find anything? And there's a snake dying in front of you and, and he's not really interested in that. It's just those moments are hilarious. But as a kid, if you grew up with them, you don't really connect those dots, but um, it's there. Yeah, just like the scene where um, Chris is laughing at Wesker, Wesker's face in the laboratory, and Wesker just goes, stop it. Yeah, <laughs> and I think it might have been a misportrayal, maybe, and the only evidence that we have is the remake was a little more serious in tone, but um, I mean, I still love, I still love that campy side to it. Okay, on to the next, we've got Scaredy Vision. Hey, this is us, uh, Scaredy Vision. What makes the perfect Resident Evil film? Oh, I say... 
cut out the full-blown John Woo style action of it all and take on the recipe that they have for like the CGI movies where it's more about the uh like the ambience and yes. the setting. I would watch a straight up adaptation of either RE1 remake with Lisa Trevor in it or RE7 because uh, they'd be genuinely creepy and scary in my opinion uh, and they would the most important thing would be making the setting as close to the original source material as they could don't try to tell the story of multiple games over one movie absolutely i'm looking at you welcome to raccoon city yeah i haven't seen welcome to raccoon city yet but i've heard bad things and i can appreciate that it looked like they sometimes tried to at least capture the aesthetic make it look like the games we love that's what yeah, the mean, fans want the first resident evil movie had it for the most part save for some of the super action moments where she's running up a wall and kicking a dog oh yeah but i want those tight corridors i want to feel claustrophobic i want to know not what's around the next corner i want something creeping up on me and spooking the shit out of me that's yeah. why i think seven would make a great adaptation yeah, that's kind of why the earlier games work so well is because they put you in those exact situations it's all tight corridor shots you don't have a an over-the-shoulder camera that you can use to peek around corners and stuff like that i'd and, like to see them get guillermo del toro to uh, help him with one of those movies because yeah, even possible. if he were to do things from a different perspective you know it would still be good most and you likely know he would yeah. probably still respect the material that's our point of view for what would make the best resident evil film check us out scaredy vision we drop an episode every week see you next time guys yeah they make good points you know i would love to see guillermo del toro Ooh, when I heard Guillermo del Toro's name, I was like, ooh, yes. He sure. could probably give us a really creepy hunter. Oh, my God. Oh. Yeah. Every time they bring the hunters into certain games, they poorly animate their movements in the like, cutscenes and stuff. And I keep thinking, for Pete's sake, get a fluid motion. Don't get robotic movements. <laughs> well, if you, if, if you bring a hunter in one of these movies, the hunter has to decapitate somebody. I would, that would be to amazing. use special effects with the hunter, up close shots and all that stuff like they did in the first one, where mm. they shoot the dog and stuff. Oh. You could also bring up the scene from Resident Evil 3, when Carlos is entering the, the, hospital. the hospital, and you randomly got a hunter just jumping, decapitating, uh, decapitating the, zombie. the zombie. That's a really great introduction. But it's interesting they brought up the whole um, Resident Evil 1 remake or a Resident Evil 7 adaptation. I think a lot of people like 7 because it's like one of those contained thrillers. Like it's within a house and you're kind of like running away from these people that are coming after you Texas Chainsaw style. I think a lot of Western audiences love that kind of feel. And I don't know if you guys feel the same way. Resident Evil Village, it was more theatrical in nature with Lady D. Resident Evil 7 was kind of like, it brought it back to the groundedness. It felt way tighter as far as the scares and stuff. Village has some good moments too, but I feel like Western audiences respond better to 7. I couldn't agree more without being disparaging of Village. Mm -hmm. After Remake, that was almost the next Resident Evil game that really resonated with me in being in that haunted star mansion. A lot of places in the Baker Estate is really tight-knit, and you're always terrified of something bursting through the wall. Oh, yeah. When Mr. Baker grabbed me from, from behind, it was just like, <laughs> you know, welcome to the family. I was spooked. Like, I love Lady D, but man, him just like punching me, that scared the hell out of me. There's a lot of scary moments, that Margaret. Margaret. Oh, my God. That boss <laughs> fight is yeah. insane. I actually played at MVR, and I got till Jack punched me in the face. And, I, and then I'm like, nope, giving me motion sickness, and I also don't want to see Jack Baker this up and close. Yeah. One thing that Scary Cats did pick up on, and we mentioned it in our discussion, was this one game versus the two games in one film. Clearly, it didn't pay off. There wasn't enough time for both stories to be adequately portrayed within the time that he had. But, Sean, how would you feel? I'm thinking of series like Westworld and Season 1 of The Witcher. I think I'm one of the few people that really did enjoy the back and forward we had in Season 1 of The Witcher. Mm -hmm. The fact that with Westworld in Season 1, you weren't actually aware that simultaneous timelines, actually, they were two generations apart. So I think right. if, if this was in the hands of someone that was very adept at the use of very clever timeline flashbacks do you think there would be potential to have the two films in one and when we're going through the spence mansion we're retreading the steps of george trevor from 67 i think say for example if you did resume one and two together i don't know if it would still have the breathability that it deserves for a film but if you incorporated that into a series added more elements to these characters and for some reason jill's investigating the trevor family and then she you know she finds the evidence that they died decades ago 
let's just say for some reason she thought that it was happening now. That's just one example and realizing this happened a long time ago. But yeah, as far as like Claire finding her brother Chris and you cut back and forth with great editing and timing and pacing, Chris is like in the next room, but then it actually happened like a long time ago, like in Code Veronica or something like that, you know, that would work very well. On to our next call in, and this one has kindly been recorded by Silver Serpent. Hello, Crimson Head Alder team, and hello to your guest speaker, Mr. Sean Leverett. I'll just start by saying that the 12 minute short concept video made a lot of Resident Evil fans excited. It had so much potential and it's disappointing to know that it wasn't given the green light it deserved. Because within 12 minutes, it gave us the same level of thrill and tension that we experienced while we were playing Resident Evil games. And it mirrored the atmosphere. If ever you're given the chance to change something from what was shown in the concept video, is there anything that you would change? These days, it's challenging to create a movie or a TV series based on anything because there will always be a comparison. But for my second question, what approach would you take in order to find the balance between audiences who don't have an idea about Resident Evil yet and fans who have known the franchise for a long time? How would you make the plot still interesting and surprise people who are familiar with the Resident Evil lore but still make it simple and catch the attention of a new audience? Lastly, what are the rules that you personally follow when it comes to creating a movie or TV series based on a video game? Do you have some kind of a list of do's and don'ts? Thank you very much, Silver Serpent. Another great call in. Some tough questions for you there, Sean. A lot of tough questions there. <laughs> If I changed anything, that would be based off of people's reactions to it. As a filmmaker and to engage with the audience, you have you know test screenings that dictates whether or not things are working. If the majority of people come at me and say, like, this doesn't work, I can definitely consider it. As far as my buddies that um, when we reviewed cuts of Dave, they would say, ah, I don't like this shot. I'll take a note of that. And then if another friend comes at me and says the same thing, I would have to consider that immensely because you know if I respect their opinion enough that they're telling me from this creative standpoint, Point that this isn't working, then you know I have to consider that whether or not you have an ego as far as whether you believe passionately about something, you have to like constrain that and believe that you have to trust these other people and you have to trust that they know and want to help you too. Filmmaking is a team sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As far as balancing between audiences, I think we talked about this, trying to balance people that have no idea what Resident Evil is. And I think, again, you have to have strong legs that attach to the original concept. You have to have a good hook for a film or series. And every five to 10 minutes, you have to have a new question that arises within audience members to be like, oh, I have to know what happens to the gym now. Like, he's taking these pills. What's about that? What happened to Dave, etc.? These things aren't related to Resident Evil. And if that hooks you and you want to see more connections for example, then I, I would imagine it did its job if it was spiritually done well with the Resident Evil series. That's another thing. When it comes to fans, I wouldn't want them to just walk into something already knowing what the twists and turns are, because otherwise that's kind of boring in a way, because you, yep. you want to engage yourself in hours of content. And if you already know the turns, you're just liking it because it's adapting what you already know. I would ask you as an audience member, why do you like it so much if you already know what's happening? The do's and don'ts of adapting, I don't really have a rule book. I just feel like as a creative person and any creative person, you kind of have like your own connection to what works and what doesn't for you. And if for some reason, when you make something and if, if there's resistance to that feeling, whatever that is, for example, like a piece of dialogue that's not flowing, you definitely have to reconsider that and translate that differently. It's all an organic process. All I care about is finding characters that have some sort of meaning on screen. If you throw characters at me on screen that have no relevance to what's happening, I don't think that's going to jive well. For many people, they're asking why. Why do I? Why should I care about this character? And I think when you're in a pitch meeting, producers, executives, they ask these questions. They want to know why should we care about this character? Why should we follow this journey for this person for five or six seasons? What are the changes? What are the arcs for this? I don't look at a rule book. I don't look at guidelines. I just have a feeling, and I personally have my own journal. Before I'm even directing on set, I'll fill out like the inner workings of these characters. Like Dave, I, ha I had a whole journal filled with Dave content that I, I myself figured out as a director that Dave, oh, I figured out new things about Dave that I hadn't thought about before. It's always good to have a journal, whether or not you're creative. It's always good to have something for your daily routine to keep you interested and fastened to it. 
I think it's great that Silver Serpent, like every call-in so far that we've had that talks about Dave, picks up on what you did so successfully, that you've got these serious strengths that have been used as a base to then build on, but not constrained with a narrative that's 100% committed to the video game. But you've done that while still including survival horror themes within a narrative that is just set free from being constrained to the video game. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Now on to the next call. We've got a call from Lady Akumu. Hi there, this is Akumu. What a perfect Resident Evil movie to me would be. That is a movie with Steve and Claire, preferably an adaptation of Code Veronica, with uh, lots of cleave in it. I guess my Resident Evil and shipper needs are quite simple. Just lots of cleave, Claire, and lots of Steve. Hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Back girl, we told you, you can't pretend you're somebody else yes when did you change your name to lady akumu 100 <laughs> on board with lady akumu yes <laughs> yes is that your sister <laughs> <laughs> she's my spiritual sister now is this going to be uh st perry's latest novelization of code veronica you got steve on the front cover without a shirt on and then claire's <laughs> right beside him and he's got the golden oh, guns heavens. <laughs> he's got the golden guns twisted around her <laughs> Thank you, Lady Akumu. You probably gathered we're all very passionate about Code Veronica. I think with Code Veronica, the production designer, if it were to be adapted, would love that story because they would have to do stylized interiors so differently and so interestingly. You have this huge doll in the middle of a room, for example. It's oh, doing yeah, this it's dance and it's also scary at the same time. I think, again, Guillermo del Toro would do oh, fantastic work doing wow. something like that. If they give him any narrative through the series, it would have to be Code Veronica. You're right. Give him Code Veronica. I think that would be phenomenal. Please. Um, <laughs> Claire investigating this mansion and you have the Ashfords like doing their thing, you know, screaming at mirrors and like very psycho. He would do it wonderfully. He could also make an insanely great banter, Sanchez. We now have a call from Dakota. My name is Dakota and I just wanted to share my thoughts on the Resident Evil movies. Now, the first one from 2002 is probably the best one by far. It's not great. It's barely decent. But, you know, its story and elements felt like they belonged in the world of Resident Evil. The other movies, however, are just, oh god, I don't want to curse or nothing. No offense to folks who did like those movies, but to me, they should never have existed. A good Resident Evil movie would have been a faithful retelling of the first game. A faithful retelling, but with, you know, some extra elements added to it to spice things up. You had all these really cool locations where you could have had these really amazing set pieces take place. And you can mix things up and change things a little bit too. Like in the game where you encounter Yawn in the attic, well, you could have had this scene in the movie where the giant snake bursts out of the wall and chases the characters through the hallways of the mansion. And you wouldn't see it coming because it never happened in the game. You could also do the same thing with the characters as well. How about you switch it up and have Chris and Jill and Barry and Rebecca? Or Jill and Rebecca and Chris and Barry? These characters could have these moments with each other as the story progresses that you couldn't see in the game. That'd be really badass, in my opinion. So long as you have the right person in charge of the project, this could be done very well. I appreciate you guys listening to me. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Dakota. Would we all agree that of the Paul W. Sanderson films, if we were forced to watch one, we would all choose the first one. It's the first one, isn't it, that kind of feels investigative, which is what I really enjoy about the journey through the Spencer Mansion. It's not just all about blood and gore and zombies. There's very much that kind of investigative detective element to it. Yes, definitely. There are some good parts that are within the first film that resonate most for audiences um, and even fans. There are moments there that work. I like the actual um, talk about the uh, action set pieces that we could see, like the snake or the shark, for example. I think within a film, a strong, capable film has like those um, set pieces, you know, within, for example, like the intro or the teaser during the first couple minutes of the movie. And then you usually typically have like an action set piece that happens in the middle. But um, I think one of the monsters very underutilized has been the snake because we haven't seen a good representation of that yet. I'd love to see an interesting perspective on the snake fight and having Jill or Chris run away down a hallway, slamming through zombies, you know, for stuff like that that we haven't seen before that's not just secluded to one, like, attic room. You can also have Richard dying, showing how he got bit by the snake. And we can hear more of Joe screaming. I would love that. <laughs> 
Dakota's absolutely right. You've got those extended areas mm. that could flesh out the narrative and, and then would allow you that time for the film to breathe and to have character development and character arcs. Richard, like a redemption arc, we may even have that backstory because Richard very much felt responsible for his sister's death. His sister, I think, was murdered and he felt that he didn't do enough to protect her. So that's very much why he has mm. that, that sense of wanting to protect Jill or Chris. That's great, yeah. though. Okay, well, thank you, Dakota. Those were all our call-ins, fantastic call-ins. Thank you so very, very much. You know, we wouldn't be here without the community that supports us. Thank you very much for all of those call-ins. This has been a great experience. love talking to you guys. Looking forward to our future sessions. Yes. No, absolutely. I- thank you so much. Stay mm-hmm. tuned because what we will do is podcast listeners have enjoyed listening to Sean's very personal insight. We would hopefully like to broadcast that live stream, watch Dave live on Twitch, listening to Sean's director's commentary. And then, of course, we can have a little Q&A with the fans and we can pick up on further points. So from me, George Trevor, Sean, thank you so very, very much. You've spent hours with us. It's been actually fantastic as someone who has been very much disappointed with the way that Resident Evil has has been portrayed on the screen this has definitely been very much some way in that road to recovery we very much hope to see that develop into a production thank you so much for those kind of words it's my pleasure just being able to talk to you guys and i'm glad it came full circle that you guys were able to see this version and previous iterations of it looking forward to more and uh hoping to have you guys on the ride for more you're doing amazing, amazing work. I just want to see more. I want your project to go and you to be given a very large budget. Me too. Keep me in mind for extra work if, if that happens. We'll be in touch. <laughs> and we do appreciate you being here and sharing everything. We do appreciate it. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, it's been a very insightful conversation. <laughs> Hopefully we have more insights and we get Resident Evil the movies consistent, you know, just keep going with it. All right, let's get hot dogs and beer. 